right, Maranatha. And welcome everybody to Revelation's final warning. It's Amazing Facts Summit, weekend summit. We're excited to have you here. And we're going to finish off today with a special Q&A with our speakers. Some are the homegrown Amazing Facts and some are our guest speakers that have come in. Who wants to say thank you, say amen to all everybody, amen. How many of you have been blessed? Woo, that's what I love about this, right? I am blessed with all the presentations they have been Wonderful, and so we're going to spend some time now with questions that some of you here that are in person have left, have given us these questions, and some questions have been also sent to us through social media and different other avenues. And so before we begin, let's have a word of prayer. Pastor Lomacain, can you lead us out in prayer? Sure. Loving Father in heaven, we are blessed to be able to allow your spirit to have his way in our lives. Amen. And we ask, Lord, that as we are open to these Bible questions that we ask for you to guide our minds and our fingers to not only find answers, but to uplift Christ, not only to clear up whatever confusion may exist or whatever question is going to be asked, but to desire to bring someone to, into a closer relationship with you. So be with us, Lord. Unite us, and may your name be glorified and honored, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, so we want to remind you that if we, at the end, everybody will receive a book written by Pastor John Lo McCain, The Three Angels Message in Summary, all right? So don't remember, you'll get this on your way out. Let's start with the first question. This is for Pastor Doug. Pastor Doug, the question is, how would you approach a person who is angrily invested in evolution? Angrily invested, passionate, I guess it would be the word. Well, you know... Um Someone once said, a person convinced against their will is of the same opinion still. And so it's really hard to reason with someone if they're angry, you don't want to, uh, if they're not open. If a person's open to discuss it peacefully and use reason and logic, you know, first I'd establish that. Um, it never helps to get into a shouting match with anybody. But, um, you know, I think the first thing you have to also understand is why. I'd ask them, why are you so invested in this view? And then start to gently explore with them and, and ask uh, questions that would be probing to get them to second guess some of the, um, the, the um, sandy foundations that they're building their, their whole worldview on. Amen. Next question for Pastor David Shin. If we can't see God's face to face, if we can't see God face to face, why were the disciples able to see Jesus after the resurrection? We're told in the book Desire of Ages that Jesus was to forever retain the human nature, which indicates that through the plan of redemption, the entire human race was elevated. We are connected with the Godhead in a way that is unique. Jesus will be human forever. Not only that, the center of the universe will transfer to the earth. So, so the reason why they could look at the face of God after the resurrection is that he was, he was still human. The divinity of Christ was veiled in humanity and forever throughout the ceases ages of eternity, Jesus will be our elder brother. Amen. Wow. Amen. Next question. This is uh, for Pastor John Lomacain. This is in regards to your presentation tomorrow, so it's a teaser. Is the image of the beast a counterfeit of the image of God? If so, how? Well, the answer is yes. Anything that Satan does, remember Isaiah 14, 14, he said, I will be like the Most High. And in every attempt ever since the fall of humanity, he has sought to replace you have a couple of examples in Scripture. You have uh, Christ is referred to as the brazen serpent when you look and you live. But Satan is referred to as the serpent of old. Um, you find in Revelation uh, the lamb-like beast. That's the one reference in Revelation that does not refer to Christ exactly, directly, but it's talking about a counterfeit of the true lamb of God. You find Satan is the roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, but Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. So you see every time, every attempt, there's, a, there's an attempt to replace the, um, and we, we sometimes may refer to Satan as uh, 
type or antitype, but Christ is before all. So he is the standard by which all are measured. So the answer in a nutshell is simply yes. Everything that Christ has an original of, Satan seeks to replicate or personate with a counterfeit. Amen. Next question is for Pastor John Ross uh, about your presentation last night on the 144,000. It says, have the 144,000 last day disciples already been chosen by God? And are some of them at work now since we are in the very last days? Third part would be, would, you, would they be aware of their special calling and mission before the second coming? Or would they find out once they're standing with the Lord on Mount Zion? Okay, very good. Uh, all of us are called to be part of God's end time people proclaiming the everlasting gospel. So if you have taken the name of Christ, you're a disciple of Christ. Every disciple has been given a work, and that is to reveal Jesus in our life, through our actions, through our words. So we're all participating. Everyone who has the seal of God, there's only two groups at the end of time. Those who have the seal of God, and those who have the mark of the beast. So if you don't have the seal of God, you're going to end up with the mark of the beast. The seal of God is a revelation of God's character. Those who are receiving the character of God by faith, through the surrender of self, the new covenant promise, God's law, has been written upon the hearts and the lives of people. I believe that work is happening now. It has not reached its fullness by any means. But the Bible tells us, according to Revelation chapter 18, that before probation closes, the whole earth will be illuminated with the glory of God. We call that the fourth angel's message. We're going to talk about that tomorrow. But that revelation of the glory of God is a revelation of his character through his church by those who by faith have received the seal of God. So will we know whether or not we have the seal of God? I think all of us right now should be seeking for a deeper and fuller relationship with Jesus. And it's not by might nor by power, but it's by thy spirit. And friends, don't ever think that you're going to get to the point where you feel as though you have now arrived and you are complete and perfect. Matter of fact, the moment you start thinking that you're doing just fine, beware because you're on the brink of falling. We will always sense our need of Jesus. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we'll need or we'll see how much more we need Jesus. That's evidence that the Spirit of God is working upon us. So the true issue at stake, talking about the seal of God, it's a heart issue. Jesus is looking for men and women who are surrendered to him and trusting completely in him. And then they'll have the attitude, Lord, whatever you want me to do, that's what I'm going to do. And that's the kind of people that God can use. That's these end-time apostles taking the three angels' messages to the world. Amen. Dwayne? Yeah, there's one thing I wanted to add to that is, um, remember the 144,000, they, they're those who are redeemed from the earth. They go through the time of trouble. And when you read Jeremiah 30, 5 through 7, it refers to God's people going through what was called the time of Jacob's trouble. And... That means Jacob's experience will be their experience. And Jacob was not aware that he was an overcomer. God had to tell him that. So it will be with God's people in the last days. They're not going to say, well, we're sealed, we're perfected, we, you know, we are perfect now. It, it'll be nothing like that. We, we're actually going to be going through soul anguish like never before, not realizing that, in fact, we are overcomers. So I think that that's just a good verse, to con a good passage to s consider about God's people going through that time of trouble, the 144,000. Amen. Next question. Pastor Daniel, you talked about the supreme God as Elohim. The question is, is there anything that God cannot do? Uh, that's kind of like a trick question. Like, is there a box that God can build that's so strong that he can't break out of it? And really, when you think about it, the Bible tells us in 1 John chapter 4 and verse 8, God is love. And in order for love to exist, there must be freedom. So when you look at God's character and how he deals with humanity all throughout the Bible, freedom of choice comes up all throughout the Bible. Joshua 24 verse 15 says, choose you this day whom you will serve. So one thing God cannot do is he cannot force anyone to do anything. He gives everyone free choice, free will. And I'm very thankful for that. Another thing he cannot do is he cannot recreate another you because you are the sum total of all the previous choices that you have made that have made you who you are today. God can't recreate you because that's all based on your free will. 
And God cannot break his government of love. He will never do that. So God does throttle his power as you look at the great controversy. But God is still all powerful. Amen. Amen. Could I add something to that? Yeah. Because there are four things that God cannot do. Lie. Oh, yeah, thank you. Die, fail, or change. Amen. Amen. One more. One more. <laughs> there, are five, there, there are five things God can do. <laughs> um, James 1 and verse 13. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted with evil. So that will be five. That will be five. <laughs> Actually, there's... No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Next question. This question is for uh, Pastor Dwayne Lemon. Uh -oh. Pastor Dwayne, what is the difference between imparted and imputed righteousness? Oh, my. Imparted and imputed righteousness. You know, <clears throat> imparted righteousness is something God does uh, for us. I'm trying to think of the best way to explain that. Imparted righteousness would be synonymous to what today were what we would call justification. Um, you know, imputed righteousness is today what we would call sanctification. So when we think about justification, we, we come to God recognizing there's nothing I can do, but only you can do on my behalf if I just simply lay myself before you, confess my sins, etc. And then God imparts his righteousness to us merely based on that confession and acceptance. Then there's a cooperation with God after that. You'll kind of hear Jesus say these things like go and sin no more and, you know, these type of things and, and, and go on unto perfection, etc. Now he's talking about living the obedient life. That obedient life is still dependent upon the power of God. We still are dependent upon God for the ability to obey and that is when God is now imputing his righteousness unto us day by day, empowering us to live the sanctified life. And so sometimes some of the easiest ways to do that is, you know, imparted is the way or means that God justifies. Impu imputed is the way God enables us to live the sanctified life. So that's kind of like the simple, that's a beautiful study actually, but that's my simple little explanation on it. Yeah, just to, just to add to that, uh, one person explained it this way. They said, Justification is freedom from the penalty of sin, for the wages of sin is death. And if you accept Jesus as your personal Savior, he took your place. He died for you. Sanctification is freedom from the power of sin, for if the Son sets you free, you shall be what? Free indeed. That's Jesus giving us victory. So freedom from the penalty, freedom from the power, and then when Jesus comes, it's freedom from the presence of sin because we are glorified and sin and sinners are no more. Amen. And the presence has to do with the consequences, pain, suffering, all that other stuff. Amen. Uh, Dr. Shin, will you please explain the difference between the functioning of the soul and the spirit? The, the difference between the soul and the spirit. You open that can of worms. <laughs> As we discussed in our earlier presentation, the body-soul dichotomy really comes from Greek philosophy. So you don't open the hood of a car and say, where's the car? You don't look at yourself and say, where's the soul? So when we talk about a soul, we're talking about the holistic nature of man. When we talk about the spirit, it depends in what sense the scripture uses it, but the Bible says we should walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. It's talking about conscience, reason, the higher powers as used in the spirit of prophecy. So they're not synonymous. The spirit is not synonymous with the soul. The spirit has to do with the, the, the sense of, of right, the sense of conscience. Romans 7 talks about those things that we want to do and yet we don't do them, the things that we hate that we do. And by the Holy Spirit, he empowers us so that we can, on a day-to-day -day basis, walk in the Spirit 
and not in the flesh. So the short answer to that is that the soul is not synonymous with the spirit. In Romans 8, according to my understanding, the spirit has to do with the conscience, and it's only by the grace of God that we can follow our conscience to walk in the spirit and not in the flesh. Amen. This next question is for Pastor Doug. Pastor Doug, where is the location of Mount Sinai? Is it in Saudi Arabia or in Egypt? Well, uh, first be assured your salvation will not hang on this answer. <laughs> so if you're looking for a chance to take a nap, this would be that moment. Um, you know, traditionally they have uh, placed the, uh, the location where most of the tourists go is Mount Sinai. It was uh, called St. Catherine's Monastery. It's actually the Sinai Peninsula. Once, uh, I guess it's in the territory of Egypt now, it's gone back and forth. Um, there's no real historical basis for that. Uh, Constantine's mother converted to Christianity and somehow she helped fund that that was a location. Um, another more popular, or a location that's becoming more popular, it's actually in Saudi Arabia. And I'm inclined to think that that's more valid. For one thing, you read in uh, Galatians chapter 4, verse 25, it says, For this, Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia. Now, the word Arabia is sort of a broad word that means desert. It was the arid land that was um, east of Israel. But you look where um, God told Elijah, when Elijah was running through the wilderness and an angel met him and gave him some food, and it says he went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to the mountain of the Lord. He did not need 40 days and 40 nights to go to the Sinai Peninsula. So it was probably more likely he went to this other location, I think it's Jabal Luz, in um, Saudi Arabia. All right. Thank you very much. This next question is for Pastor John. Pastor John, how do I know if the judgment of the living has started? Are you talking about Pastor John Lomacain or Pastor Jean. John Ross? Oh, Pastor okay. Jean Ross. About that. I'm sure Pastor Sorry. John would be excited to share on that one. Um, how do we know if judgment, the pre advent judgment, has started with the living? We don't know when the pre advent judgment starts with the living. It might have started. We don't know. But the bottom line is, and I think it's neat important for us to understand, today is the day of your salvation. Uh, today, we are to come to be measured, as we mentioned, by faith, entering into the presence of God. We can't live the Christian life banking on time that we don't have. We can't put off tomorrow the choices that we need to make today to come into harmony with the will of God. So is there a judgment occurring? Yes. Has it begun with the living? Could be. I don't know. God knows. Uh, there is no big revelation that occurs to tell us we've moved now from the dead to the living. But in reality, I mean, people are making eternal decisions every day that's going to uh, determine whether they saved or lost. And of course, when life ends, that's it. Probation closes. So today is the day of our salvation. We don't know for sure. The Bible doesn't tell us when judgment starts with the living. But let's be ready for we know not the hour, so to speak. We've got to be ready. Amen. Could I ask something? John. That? Okay. This is the John, not the Jean. Not Jean. Yeah, it's the French version. It's the English version here. Um, <laughs> the word judgment has a broad application. Uh, a judgment is made in, in the investigative aspect and in the verdict aspect. I believe that the investigative judgment is going on now. But there are a couple of things that we have to, I think, bring into clarity about the judgment. The world is going to be judged because it rejected Christ. But the judgment begins with those who accept Christ. This has been a topic that has been so much challenged. I know many people have heard about people challenging the investigative judgment, challenging whether 1844 has any validity in the history of Adventism or even Scripture. Well, the Bible says, you know, 1 Peter 4, 17, the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of God. And if it begins with us first, what will be the end of those who do not obey the gospel of God? If the righteous are scarcely saved, where will the sinner and the ungodly appear? So whoever doesn't believe is judged already. The executive phase of that is the lake of fire. But there's no need for an investigative side because they never declare Jesus as their Lord. So I don't have to investigate the wicked to see whether or not they're saved the laws. The investigation 
of whether you are living based on what you've confessed is to the righteous only. You declare the Lord doesn't begin with those who never declared him. He begins with those who declare him. That's what we need to be more concerned about. How are we living? Because we declare him. We can't say, well, I wonder where my family member is going to uh, you know, end up or where people that don't know God are going to end up. The Bible makes that clear. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe is condemned already. So the judgment is not necessarily for those who reject Christ. It's for those who claim to accept him. And um, so it is our expedience that we'd be, we judge ourselves first before we enter unto the judgment of the Lord. Examine yourself. Judge your own selves to see whether or not you're in the faith. So I'm, I'm, I'm honest with you. My wife and I can talk about this very candidly. We have seriously said, you know, there's nothing worse than to preach this message, proclaim this message, and end up lost. So we are seriously saying, Lord, we're praying the prayer of David. Try me and know my heart. See if there's any wicked way in me. I don't want the smallest or the largest thing to keep me out of the kingdom. So before we fear the judgment, start judging yourself. Amen. Amen. This is for Daniel. Daniel, you mentioned that the papacy is the head of Babylon. Does that mean that all Catholics are Babylonians? <laughs> In Revelation chapter 18, we're going to talk about this tomorrow. God says, come out of her, my people. Amen. So every human has the potential to be a son or a daughter of God if they choose to, whether they're in Babylon or not. And God wants, he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Amen. Yeah, one of the verse that comes to mind, Jesus said, other sheep I have that are not of this fold. He said, them I must bring. They will hear my voice. They will come. There'll be one fold and one shepherd. Now, it's interesting, Revelation 18, we might be talking more about this tomorrow, but I've got to mention it now. When the message is given of the fourth angel, Babylon is fallen, is fallen, then after the message is given with a loud voice, then John says, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people. When the church gives the message, then Jesus calls these people to come out of Babylon. But we have a part to play in that. We need to give the message, and Jesus will call these people to come out. Amen. I think that has to do with what Dwayne and, and John were talking about, that at the same time that you might not be, you might be part of the remnant message, but you might be a Babylonian. So also you might be in Babylon, but you might have a remnant heart, right? right. Just not revealed all of the truth yet to make that decision. I just yeah. wanted just to... Just like with the, the old covenant, new covenant. You can be living right now in 2022. In the old covenant experience. Old covenant. And... Amen. So, yeah. Amen. This next question is for uh, Pastor Dwayne. Pastor Dwayne, could you worship the beast without worshiping the image? Could you worship the beast? And well, not worship necessarily the image of the beast. Well, again, so <clears throat> if we're dealing with the context of Revelation 13, then my answer would be no, because the image of the beast, the whole function of that is to combine the church and state to emphasize what the beast wants and to fall in line with the beast's will. So if you are worshiping the beast, then that means that you must have complied with the principles connected to the image of the beast. So I, I could not see how you could separate them. Disconnect that. them. Yeah, they would have to go together. All right. No? Okay. Next question is for Pastor John Loma King. Mm -hmm. Pastor John, you mentioned that there are some influences of Babylon that are, that are influencing the church. Will those influences be eradicated, eliminated, or in the separation, or will they be together until the end? The question was asked by Peter when the Lord talked about wheat and tear growing together. And Peter said, should we go and root out the wheat? And the Lord said, no, lest you root out the tears also. One of the things we don't have is the ability to determine who's wheat and tear. And the Lord made a very important statement. He said, let both grow together until the harvest and I will send my angels. So our message is to be a message that, rev that, as Isaiah 58, verse 1 says, I'll lift up your voice as a trumpet, show my people their transgression, and the house of Jacob their sin. Our job is to reveal the sin and reveal the sin bearer and reveal the one who can save us from our sin. 
But our job is not to determine who is saved and who is lost. But to answer the question more directly, these influences will continue not until the coming of the Lord, but until the sealing work is done. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous and holy, let him be holy still. And when that cutoff is done, then the polarization is complete. There will be nobody straddling the fence at the appearing of the Lord. Both groups will be permanently set. And that's when the sealing work is completed. So, yeah, these influences will be there. But just, uh, as I said today, make sure that the influences not, don't, don't become a part of your own practice. Yeah. All right. Pastor Shin, are we the last generation living on the earth? You talked about last generation. Are we the last generation living on the earth? I hope so. <laughs> but really, we don't know. The 144,000 are described as those that are translated without seeing death. We should strive to be among the 144,000. I hope I am. But if I'm not and I'm resurrected, I'll take that too. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And the important thing is that we, on a daily basis, allow the portrait of Christ to be reproduced in us. That's really what the 144,000 is all about, being like Jesus, loving like Jesus, reflecting the image of God to the world. Amen. Amen. This question is for Pastor Doug. Pastor Doug, does God punish? This is just not how Jesus was, and life only shows love, forgiveness, restoration, and mercy. I think most of us believers can say God has not punished us for what we deserve, at least not yet. So does God punish? Well, Jesus is God. So it almost sounded like in the question there was a separation between God and Jesus. Uh, the God that you see punishing in the Old Testament is Jesus. <laughs> so, you know, Jesus is also Jehovah God. But, um, yeah, there's no question that you read when, when God's character was revealed to Moses there on the mountain. He said, show me your character. And he showed, the, he revealed his character to Moses. You know the story. He put him in the cleft of the rock and he passed by and the Lord declared his name to Moses, the Lord, and I'm paraphrasing now, the righteous God, uh, great in compassion and mercy. And then he closes off by saying, who does not clear the guilty, but he visits the, the iniquity of the fathers on the children under the third and fourth generation. He actually says he by no means clears the guilty. So God is a just king. He has to punish evil. Fortunately, he sent his son into the world to take the punishment for those that will accept that, and Jesus died in our place. But there is a punishment for sin. You know, right. uh, some people say that with, with this argument, you know, there's kind of a growing trend in Christianity that says this very thing that God does not punish. And one place they'll go is Romans chapter 1, verse 26, and say that one way that God punishes is he removes his protective hand and he gives us up. So it says, for this cause, God gave them up unto vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature. And it goes on, though, if, you'll, if you keep reading, and it says, but after thy hardness and an impenitent heart treasures up unto thyself wrath against the day of wrath and revelation of, righteous, of the righteous judgment of God. So God does sometimes remove his hand, but God also actively, punitively does things to punish. You look at the flood. You look at, people forget about the seven last plagues. God is pouring out the seven last plagues. You know, just one, one more verse on that real quick. Jesus said, whoever falls upon this stone, speaking of himself, will be broken. But woe unto the one upon whom it falls, for it shall grind him to powder. And the stone is Jesus. So Jesus is alluding to Daniel chapter 2 when the stone comes and strikes the image and grinds all the metals to power, powder and the wind blows it away. Jesus is talking about himself. He says, now is the time to fall on me. Your heart will be broken. Don't let me have to fall on you. So yes, a day of judgment is coming. Uh, the wicked are destroyed with the brightness of his coming when Jesus comes a second time. The other thing I want to add to that is God never intended to, to destroy humanity. 
That was never his intention. Matthew 25, 41, the Bible makes it very clear that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. And I think that people are needlessly breaking into the devil's party that God never intended. If you want to call it a party. This, is, this event of destruction, God never set that aside for humanity. But as you were reading Romans 1, I, I was hoping you would go to verse 27 because we are recipients of the things that we are justly receiving. It says in verse 27, receiving in themselves the penalty of their error, which was due. The word error there wasn't that they made a mistake, but they chose the wrong, therefore they received the result of the wrong. And God is not a guy, I, when I was growing up, some people used to think that you know, God is waiting for us to do something wrong to punish us. No, he's not willing that any should perish. That's who Jesus is. I call him the, the Savior who refuses to stand by and watch his children die. He's made every provision, but there are those who are going to receive the punishment of God, the executive phase, because they've chosen to join the devil in his rebellion. That's the reason why I believe humanity is going to be punished. They chose to join the devil in his rebellion, uh, rebellion against God, not that God hates humanity. And punishment um, testing. You know, punishment and parenthood helps in these scenarios so much because, <laughs> you know, punishment is not just what you distribute to someone. It's also what you withdraw or take away from someone. You know, if someone is, is if, if a child is being punished, it's not necessarily that you, you're going to give them a disciplinary spanking or something, but it's the fact that you might withdraw certain things from them. You know, you might say, okay, you don't have this privilege anymore. You don't have this or you don't have that. Uh, in Acts 17, 28, the Bible says, in him, talking about Christ, we live, move, and have our being. And there are times that if we continue to indulge in sin, and it was referenced in Romans 1, 26, that God will give you up. He will withdraw his spirit. He will remove his hand of protection. That's a punishment as well. So, you know, really, the, the movement that says God does not punish or God does not kill, it, it, they, they really are not studying faithfully and accepting what the word of God simply says. They're adding to it. One, one final thing, too. In, in Isaiah chapter 5, God says, why would you die? Uh, or not, sorry, what more could I do? What more could I do? And he asks that. Amen. Brother Lemon. Yes. Revelation 14, 12 talks about the faith of Jesus. What is the difference between faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus? Man. Okay, so cliffhanger. I mean, we got to leave that because tomorrow... <laughs> When we do the, 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 the call to endurance, we're going to build on that point. But I will say there definitely is a difference between faith in Jesus and the faith of Jesus. So we'll build on that tomorrow. Stay tuned. Got to come back and check it out. Okay, I'm not going to preach a sermon, but I got to say something. <laughs> you know, I preach a sermon called The Faith of Demons. Uh, demons believe, but they don't live. Okay, demons believe that there's God and they tremble. So I'll leave the rest to you tomorrow. Yeah. So there's a faith that does not lead to salvation, and the demons have that. All right. Pastor Shin, how do I share the truth about death and the resurrection and the afterlife with my family members who do not believe like I do? They believe they are all in heaven. I think there's an appropriate time and place. A funeral's not the best time to share uh, about these elements, likely when they're mourning the death of a loved one. I was giving a Bible study to an individual that really struggled with this. Uh, they took solace in the fact that their grandmother had been looking down on them for, for years, and there was an emotional connection they had with their grandmother. So I think we need to be sensitive to where the person is. There's an appropriate time and place. Uh, we need to cooperate with the Holy Spirit, and one of the things that has been helpful to me in ministry is to recognize that there is no absence of the third person of the Godhead. He does not call me to be the Holy Spirit. Praise God. He doesn't call me to convert. He doesn't call me to convict. He does call me to cooperate. And so we can cooperate. We can pray for that person and ask for the right timing, the right words to speak, and, and ask the Lord to do the convicting and the co converting as they surrender to the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Jean Ross is the 144,000 literal or symbolic number. I was waiting for that question. <laughs> Whenever you talk about the 144,000, people always ask, is that a literal number? 
Uh, first of all, I think what, the reason why people are so concerned about that, and they want to they know, is it just 144,000 that are going to be saved when Jesus comes? The tendency is for a person to do the math and start counting and go, man, 144,000, that's not that many. And they figure out, well, you know, you can probably put 144,000 in, in one big soccer stadium, perhaps. And Well, if there's only going to be 144,000 translated without seeing death, I'm sure there's 144,000 more righteous people than me in the world, so what are my chances? So I might as well give up. There is a tendency, if that's your, your approach, to start to compare yourself amongst yourself and start thinking, man, at least I'm better than he is or she is. Uh, if, if God's counting, uh, I have a better chance to get in than he does, all right? <laughs> no, the bottom line is God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance you know, this is not a new, uh, incidentally, it's not just a literal, I think we're all agreeing, it's not just a literal 144,000 that are going to be translated when Jesus comes the second time. Um, does God have a group of people in the last days that are going to do a special work? He's end time, teaches and preaches the gospel? Absolutely. But I remember a reading back in Ellen White's day, there was a controversy over who was going to make up the 144,000, and I like her response. She says, don't worry about it. We will know soon enough. That's a good answer. Don't worry about it. We'll know soon enough. The bottom line is, by God's grace, we all can be part of those if, if God wills it and we are fully committed to Him. So uh, God is not counting up there. And when He gets to 144,000, He says, I'm sorry, I can't save you. I've reached up my number now. And God doesn't work that way. Dwayne? You know, uh, in the pen of inspiration, there, there's a term that's used... You can hear me? Okay. In the pen of inspiration, there's a term that's used that has helped me tremendously, especially in my early years in the movement. Uh, the term is side issues, living issues. Side issues and living issues. Living issues are things that's imperative that we agree on or should strive to see if we can agree on it. Because a living issue is something that can affect our salvation. So therefore, it's a living issue, and that's why we press it. So when we talk about sanctuary, uh, you know, state of the dead, victory over sin, or any of these topics, these are living issues. So this is what we strive and put our energy towards of seeing how we can harmonize with the Word of God as a people. But then there's side issues. And side issues are things that are great points for discussion, but they have no bearing on our salvation at all. And so when it comes to the, the 144,000, literal or symbolic, let us remember that even if we disagree, we can both still be in heaven because it's a side issue. It's not a living issue. It, it, you know, it, oh, you believed it was symbolic? Sorry, you're going to hell. I mean, that just doesn't work. Oh, you believe it was literal? Oh, well, welcome to the pearly gates. I mean, it, you know, it doesn't make sense. So again, that's the only thing. So even if we disagree with each other, uh, as it relates to literal or symbolic, just remember, don't invest too much time into side issues. Invest your time and your energy into living issues. And Early Writings, page 63, says it like this. There are many precious truths contained in the Word of God, but it is present truth that the flock needs now. It's like that's where our focus needs to be, is on the present truth, the living issues, not dwelling too much on the side issues. Amen. Amen. Pastor Loma Cain. Should I remain in my church, church if it resembles Babylonian worship and try to reform her instead of coming out? That's beautiful. I like the question. The problem is you're going to go to some place that's just like the place you came out of. You know, the only perfect church is an empty one. I want to say that again. The only perfect church is an empty one. There are some people whose sins are overt, some people whose sins are covert. And we think that the ones that are overt that everybody can see are just really sins, but the ones that are covert that no one can see, we may mistake that for living righteously. I've often said, and this is the measure by which you should ask yourself who you are, is who you are when no one is around is who you really are. But we often see people, that's why when we deal with uh, testing truths, and some testing truths are more obvious than others. You know, we might, we might do a topic on smoking and somebody's in the building visiting that night and they have smoke on their breath, well, they'll feel singled out. Or we may, we may talk about a topic on adornment, jewelry, and might get so passionate that we forget that there's a principle that is vitally important when we communicate anything that's testing. And I've said this to, uh, so often recently I've been saying this to people that are just, 
using issues to hurt each other. Jesus said, a bruised reed I will not break, and a smoking flax I will not quench. Meaning, if the Lord sees that your life is hanging on and you are a coal in the fireplace that's just about to die, he's not going to pour water on that and say, well, you were going to die anyway. If your life is so bruised, he's not going to just break you like a, a, a piece of wheat that's in a field that's already bruised. He's going to hold you together. So what we have to do is we have to keep in mind that statement L. White made, and I appreciate this, the same thing the Lord said, let both grow together until the harvest. Why? Because there's a shaking. I talked about that today. There's a shaking that's going to go on. That which cannot be shaken will be shaken. That which cannot be shaken will remain. So don't leave because the Lord will separate the wheat from the tear. And if you leave and your life is being lived according to God's glory, those who need to see that light, as the Bible says, make straight paths for your feet so the lame will not be turned out of the way. The Lord may say, you need to stay there so that somebody can see Christ in your life. We tend to run from one place looking for a perfect place. There are no perfect churches. We may have perfect messages, but there are no perfect people. Stay where you are and be the light that God will have you to be and let the Holy Spirit, whoever said that, I'm not the Holy Spirit, let the Holy Spirit do the work that God has said he's going to do. Let him bring conviction. Uh, there's a text. I'm going to go with me to Job 14. Let me just show you this passage. And I just, when I found this, it just, honestly, I cried when I found it because the Lord showed me something that I would always apply to just what happens when you die. When I found this passage, it gave me hope for family members that I've been praying for for years. My sister left the church when she was 16. She's in her 60s now. And today when I was singing the song, Lift Up the Trumpet and Loud Let It Ring, my wife after that, she showed me, she said, look, your sister you've been praying for after you. She said, I put a video on Facebook of you singing, Lift Up the Trumpet, Loud Let It Ring, and your sister gave you four hands up. And I've been praying. I call, I say, sis, what am I going to say to mom when I get to heaven and you're not there, you're not there. What am I going to say? She says, don't worry, I'm going to be there. And God has taught me as an, as an older pastor. You know, my, this makes me look a little older. I'm not that old, so ignore this thing that I'm growing. <laughs> but God has said to me, I'm working. I've made more investment in the saving of others than you have. Mm -hmm. So don't give up on folk that I'm still working on. Here's this passage in Job 14. Oh, my Lord, it's powerful. Job 14 and verse 17 to 19. This is about the man dies and lays away, but listen to this. For there is hope for a tree if it is cut down. We look at some people that are cut down. That it will sprout again and that its tender shoots will not cease. Though its root may grow old in the earth, they've been out of the church a long time, and a stump may die in the ground, yet at the scent of water it will bud and bring forth branches like a plant. Mm -hmm. Job chapter 14, verse 17 to 19. What God is saying, we may look at... Seven to nine. Seven to nine, sorry. I had circles around it. That's why I couldn't see it. Sorry. Sorry, because you guys need to know. Thank you. I had circles, so it's kind of hiding the numbers. I mark on my Bible sometimes. What the Lord is saying is, you may consider somebody stumped to be dead, to be in the ground. For, they've left the church so long, you may say, there's no chance they're going to make it. But when you preach Jesus, the water of life, the Bible says, yet at the scent of water, it will bring forth branches like a plant. So I'm still hoping for my sister to be in the kingdom. My brother, my family members, be the Jesus they need to see when you are around them. And at the scent of the Jesus in you, God will let that plant that seems to be old and dead sprout again and bring forth fruit. I'm still holding on. I think my sister's going to be in the kingdom, and I'm not going to give up. Every time I pray for her, I tell her I pray for her. Sunday morning, she always calls me. She's always excited. She's a retired firefighter. She wakes up early in the morning. Every Sunday morning, 
I said, sis, you know, I love you, and I want you to be in the kingdom. She says, I know. I'm going to be there. So let God do his work. Don't give up on your loved ones. Very, very quickly. Um, you know, I've been in situations where I've talked with parents, and sometimes they have very, very little children. And they might be in a church that's literally rock and roll. I mean, I, I've seen churches, strobe lights, everything, rock and roll churches. And um, they say, Dwayne, you know, I'm, the influences are really o overwhelming. My children, I don't know what to do. Yeah, so these are what we call extreme cases. So what I would say is that I don't believe any church is beyond God's reach. Um, I don't believe just because a church has apostasy or things in it that it equates to it becoming Babylon. Um, that's very shallow theology. But is it possible that a parent might be overwhelmed because of little children in a church? And maybe that church is really in a tough situation. That may be a time to say, okay, let's go ahead and consider another church maybe yeah. you could transfer to that could be more conducive. So for many of us who have, you know, personal study life and so on, absolutely, we, we should be standard bearers and, you know, hold to the light. And there's a lot you can do to try to help turn a church around. I've seen it happen. I've done it myself. So I know there's a lot you could do. And that's why I stand in 100% agreement with what Pastor John is saying. In cases of like these extremes, it may be a situation where you can say to them, okay, well, maybe we can go from there. Let's look around and see if there's some other churches that maybe can be more conducive for you and what you're trying to bring your children up because they're very, they're at very impressionable ages, right. you know, so on. So that, that's something that, that very well may be what has to be done. Amen. Yeah. Next pastor, next, per, next question is for Pastor Doug. Pastor Doug, can anyone that believes in despite believing in evolution, be saved? Mike. Yeah. Mike. Mike. Can you repeat the question? I didn't want to pick up my mic until I was ready. Question is, can, um, can someone, despite yeah. believing in evolution, still be saved? I believe so. I, I think I'd rather, um, I'd rather believe in um, the ability of God. First of all, God, you know, man looks on the outside, God looks on the heart. There are people who have grown up and all they have been taught all their lives is evolution. They believe it a fact. They can come to Jesus later in their lives and accept Jesus. And, you know, when I first accepted Christ, I still believed in evolution. Me too. Yeah. And uh, so it took a while for me to unlearn some things. So I think it'd be really limiting the Lord to say that, you know, there's going to be people in heaven that had many wives at one time. Right? <laughs> There's going to be people in heaven that smoke till the day they died. Mm. Spurgeon, John Newton wrote Amazing Grace, and I could go down the list. You'd be so right. Of course, doctors back then recommended it. So they thought, well, this is good for my lungs. So there's people who don't know better, and they're sincere, honest people, and they just think that they're believing the scientists. So to say, well, you can't be saved uh, because you don't have a perfect understanding of the Bible, um, but they, they've accepted Jesus and the Holy Spirit's worked in their lives. Yeah, I wouldn't limit the Lord. You know, when you look at uh, John 3 and verse 19, very, very powerful point. This is the condemnation, that light is come into the world and men loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. If, if you have not received the light, if you've never understood the light, you, you, you didn't get the privilege of getting a balanced presentation of the light, and you hold on even to error to the end, but you lived according to how God's spirit was able to reach you, God, God can save that individual. Evolutionist, smoker, Sunday keeper, you know, any, any of the categories where often we might say it could be a salvational issue. But if the light comes to you and the light is comprehensible and you see the light, you understand the light, but then you just choose to say, well, this, can, it, this inconveniences me. I can't do this. So therefore I choose to follow my own way. That is when condemnation comes. And so that's a very important point to remember whether it be the evolutionists or other categories of people that are not doing all of what the Word of God says. All right. Titus 2.11, the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. Amen. Last question, Dr. Shin, what does it mean to have the name of God written on our foreheads or to have the character of God? It really is this, this process and it's talking about the sealing. Ellen White indicates that the sealing process is settling into the truth intellectually and spiritually. 
And in the process of salvation, there, there's something that happens as you live the sanctified life. The book Desire of Ages indicates that we can, by the grace of God, come to the place where by following Him, we are following our impulses. In other words, following God, being like Jesus, loving like Jesus, becomes our highest delight. That's the transformation that God wants to do for all of us, where He writes His law in our hearts. And the, the illustration that I used many times to describe the process of, of sanctification, the sanctified life, is when I was learning how to drive a stick shift car, in the beginning, I, I almost needed a neck brace, whiplash, so many things going on. But then a year later, watch out. <laughs> you know, I don't mean to be arrogant, but I was good. Good drive, sandwich in one hand, cell phone in the other. I don't recommend it, but you know what I'm talking about. <laughs> what has happened? Those neural pathways. And that's the way that God has wired us. We, we, there's physiological changes when we do something over and over again. Brushing our teeth, we always hold it the same way. Tying our shoelaces, we always start with the right one. God has wired us in a beautiful way. When we accept Christ and we're baptized, God doesn't come down with a divine eraser and, and erase all of those neural pathways. They're still there. The difference is now we have the power to establish new ones by His grace. In the beginning, it can be rough. There's grace. A righteous man falls seven times and gets back up. I'm not talking about the idea that there isn't victory, but because of our fallenness, it's tough. But as we, by the grace of God, continue to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, and we make those new neural pathways, and we choose God on a daily basis because of the power that He's given us, we can come to the place because of His grace, to hate sin and to love evil. Uh, to hate sin and love good and righteousness. Amen. It's getting late. Yeah. Amen. Amen. All right. So, uh, to close, I want a, a message to anybody. We know that those that are watching and those that are here, we know that there are people right now that are struggling with their spiritual walk. We know that there are people that are, uh, they put on the mask, right? But they're really having a tough time. Would each of you give one Bible verse that you would give somebody as encouragement uh, in their spiritual walk as they're struggling with uh, learning to live by faith, learning to trust in God? One Bible verse that you would give somebody to help them, to encourage them uh, in their walk. All right, I'll Pastor start. John. Jesus said, come unto me. All he that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. It's a day by day coming to Jesus. It doesn't matter what the struggle, it doesn't matter how weak you are, you can come to Jesus. Come to Jesus every day just as you are. That will enable God to do a work in you that you cannot do for yourself. Amen. Daniel? I'm going to say this again tomorrow, but First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23 and verse 24 it says, in the very God of peace, sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. That seems like a tall order to do all that. But verse 24 is the key. It says, faithful is he who called you. He will do it. Amen. Take courage in knowing that God is faithful to do what he has said he desires to do for you, in you, and through you. Amen. Loma Cain? Philippians 1 6. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. <laughs> I'm sorry. My favorite passage in Scripture. Oh, I just love this one. First John, well, Philippians 1 6, he who has begun a good work will complete it. We know that. Okay. You said that's something, but here's the one. First John chapter 3. This is the now and the then. Beloved, now we are children of God. When? Now. now. And it has not yet been revealed what we shall be. He's still working. But we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We are his children now. He's still working. And when he's done, we're going to be just like him. Let the Lord continue his work. Amen. Amen.
Dwayne? Oh, yeah. Been my favorite verse for many, many years. Um, in Philippians 2 and verse 13, mm -hmm. for it is God which worketh in you to will and to do of his good pleasure. God can get you to a place that you not only will do his good pleasure, but you'll actually want to do it. And that kind of goes back to the quote that uh, Dr. Shin shared in Desire of Ages 668. He, he will do it. Amen. Can I do two verses real quick? <laughs> Jesus said to the woman caught in adultery, uh, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. There's two realities that Jesus states in that verse. First is, I don't condemn you. After that, the standard. Acceptance doesn't mean reducing the standard. That command is really a promise. Go and sin no more. And it's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And Jude 24, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Amen. Pastor Doug. You know, I'm, I'm, I have no one favorite verse. I'm, I'm, I'm moved by the Bible just every day, new verses. And I was just listening to a testimony this weekend and um, how Isaiah 45, verse 22, changed their life, where the Lord says, Look to me and be saved all the ends of the earth. And so if you are on the earth, you qualify to look to Jesus and what? And be saved. You know, Christ said in John 3, 15, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that whoever believes in him might not perish but have everlasting life. Lifted up means they looked at that serpent on the pole, you know, and, the, and they were healed. And it's a look of faith that transforms us. And I'd, I'd say wherever you are in your life, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. Amen. Amen. And I'll close with my encouraging words. One of my favorite verses, Isaiah chapter 26, verse 3. And thou will keep him in perfect peace. Who? Whose mind is stayed on thee. Because he trusts in thee. Trust ye in the Lord forever. For in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Amen? Amen. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That should be our number one worry, our number one anxiety. Make sure that that is the priority in your life. And it says here, when you do that, God says, I got the rest. Just keep your focus and your mind on me. Amen? Amen. 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 Thank you all very much. I want to thank the speakers for their time. It's been a long day, but who's had a, who's had a blessed day? Amen? Amen? Is there a better way to start the week than spending time in the Word of God? I don't think so. Amen? Amen. So we want to thank all of you for being here. Uh, tomorrow, at what time do we start? 8.30. What time are we going to be here? 8.15. 8.15, okay? 8.30, Pastor John Lomacain is going to start with the image of the beast. Double trouble. Uh, double trouble, which is the image of the beast. Then I'll be doing the mark of the beast. Then Daniel will be doing uh, the fourth angel, Revelation 18. And then we're going to close with Duane again tomorrow with Revelation 14, 12. Right? The person, what's the title of this? The Endurance of the Saints. Amen. So we still have four more presentations as we close, end up this tonight. We're going to have a word of prayer, and then we're going to ask you, please, to just stay, Tom. We're going to, Pastor Alden is going to come out. We're going to have a picture of all the speakers, right? And then we'll, uh, you head out, you can have um, the free book that we're giving out as John Loma Cain's The Third Angel's Message in Summary. Amen. So let's all stand. Let's all stand. Pastor Alden, if you want to come up so you can be ready. We'll take the picture, a few pictures quickly, and then uh, we'll all head out and come back tomorrow ready for some Bible study. Amen? Uh, Pastor Doug, would you lead us out in prayer, please? Father in heaven, we believe that whenever we gather together in your name and open that blessed book that you are present, and Lord, we sense that you've been speaking to our hearts through your words. We want to thank you for the ways that you've been blessing this gathering uh, Lord, we know, especially as that day approaches, it's so important for us to come together like this, to, to seek your face and study your word, and we pray that you'll be with the meetings that follow. 
bless everybody as we go to our places of rest with your presence and your spirit. We thank you and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right, so let's just all stand up here in front and...